Oh my god. <laughs> what is going on everyone? It is me, Mr. Mario, and I got so much to say about this long conference and I'm tired, so I'm going to get straight into this. This is my E3 2015 conference overview, review, whatever you want to call it, where I'm just doing a voice over this year of the first ever I had to do this because it was the first ever one, the first ever PC gaming show conference at E3. Now, you all might be asking, how did they pull this off? You know, PC's not owned by any one person directly or any one entity, and that is true. From what I saw, though, this was heavily sponsored by AMD and PC Gamer. So it was because of them. It was branded by P AMD. It said it was powered by PC Gamer, and this was a official PC gaming show. It was their first conference, and I got to say, this is how you do a conference. This conference was amazing. Now, I do have some nitpicks here and there, but we're going to go ahead and get into that. And the first nitpick is actually going to be from the very beginning. First off, I had a hard time finding this conference. I just streamed it online, and there were many places, including the official E3 website, that didn't even list this as an option. I went to IGN Stream. IGN was not covering this, and I found it on only a few websites. And when I found it on the websites, it was an hour late. It said it was supposed to start at 5 p.m. Pacific time. I was in the stream at 5 p.m. Once 5 p.m. hit, there was a one-hour countdown. So it didn't start until 6 p.m. And it, there was no pre-show or anything like it. There was no pre-show, nothing like that. No. Everyone was saying that it had started. It was supposed to start at 5 p.m., but it really started at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And this was a long show, y'all. This was two and a half hours. Like, that was 8 o'clock my time. It just finished at 10.30 my time. This was a very long conference. Probably the longest, con definitely the longest conference, actually, that I have sat through. And that was just, my God, that was insane. But... The thing is, the coordination was just horrible starting this out to begin with, because as I said, not that many people were even sure where it was. I wasn't even sure if there was a conference going on tonight, because AMD had actually done a sort of mini-conference earlier in the day that was, a, like, it was less than an hour, and I thought that might have been the conference. So, next time for 2016, I want to see a revamp of this, I want to see this come back, but please, my nitpicks right here, I'm just going to get them out of the way, one make it shorter. This conference was awesome, but I mean, <laughs> for, I think for some reason conferences are not supposed to go more than an hour and a half. Two, better organization. Please, better organization, more transparency, and three, more promotion as well too. This has been very successful. It was a very great conference. It needs to happen next year. This needs to be a recurring thing. Now, first off, what they started off with was a montage like every other um conference, excuse me, I'm a little tired here, and it was a dramatic PC build, and I was just busting out laughing because it had a guy building a PC, and then he starts gaming on it, then they had Mountain Dew without the branding on it in a bottle, and they poured it out all fancily into a wine glass, and then my favorite part was where they were showing all the games, they had Minesweeper at one point, and then the guy who was playing, there was a single tear just going down his face. And then they said it was powered by PC Gamer, and Sean, aka Day9 Plot, came out on stage. And I gotta say, this guy was fantastic. He is probably the best host I have seen, hands down, for any conference. He was amazing. There was a small stage, a small audience. I mean, still, you know, a big audience, but nothing nearly as big as... Um, Sony and Microsoft, and it was definitely bigger than Nintendo's because uh, Nintendo doesn't do a live conference anymore. But anyways, what ended up happening is he comes out, he talks about, you know, new advances in technology and everything, and it was a very relaxed talk show style setup where there was a chair, a sofa, and then he had his desk, and he had a chair behind it where it was just like a late night talk show and all that. He was really relaxed, this guy was funny, he was awesome, and the first game that came up was Killing Floor 2. Now, essentially, the developers came out, and they said our job was to not screw up Killing Floor 1. I'm a big Killing Floor 1 person. Like, I, I love that game. I have not picked up Killing Floor 2. Hopefully, it goes on sale with the Steam sales here soon. Uh, but I loved Killing Floor 1. Haven't played in a while, but I actually met one of my good friends through there as well, too. 
Uh, but you know, they were talking about early access. They said it's been early access for two months. It's gotten some great sales. They've gotten very interesting feedback from vans. It's been a big learning experience. And they've seen that it's been very important to communicate with the players for early access. You need to give them regular updates and all because they said essentially the big problem was a lot of players were paying for this game and expected the game to be finished within two weeks. It's like, no, that's, that's not how early access works. People are still figuring that out. Not only gamers, but also developers as well. They showed a slew of new features, which just shows an insane amount of new gore tech that they have in there. Uh, some more, they're going to have now, like, user-made map supports that users are creating through the SDK. And there's also going to be the Incinerate and Detonate free content pack coming out. So, I need to get this before the Steam sale is over. I definitely do. But anyways, they were saying that there is all new interaction with technology, and it seems a lot like system-oriented architecture programming, where that's essentially, they said, there's technology for this, 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 and they're trying to combine everything into one, which when you combine it into Killing Floor 2 is essentially just a metric fuck ton of blood and guts and violence and it looks awesome one big thing they said as well too is they said they have a feeling that they have the game down to the point where they feel comfortable saying that they are not going to be restarting player progression and stats so that means if you buy the game in early access right now and you start playing you are not going to have your stats reset by the time the retail game came out they did an excellent job for their first guest and this is also a uh, first reveal of, you know, everything there. Like, well, not everything, but, you know, the new features and all that. So, world exclusive right there. Now, there was also another world exclusive that was coming out. This is also from Tripwire Studios, so the same people that did this. And it was Rising Stor Storm 2 Vietnam. It is going to be a war game. It looked pretty pre-scripted. I don't know if this was actual gameplay or not, but it was very cinematic. Looks like a cool game. Star Citizen, they brought this out, and they've said that this has, at the moment, $84 million in funding, which is just absolutely insane. Now, the company, this is the only company that did not come out to the press conference, unfortunately, but the CEO had pre-recorded a video, and he said, you know, he's really sorry he couldn't come out there, he's busy working in London, but he does plan to come out for the 2016 conference, which I'm pretty sure there will be, but he was saying that he's very happy that there is a dedicated press conference at E3, and he's just happy that, you know, this is finally a thing. And he even said, you know, Star Citizen and all that, just like this. It's not financed by any corporation. It's financed by you, and it speaks power from PC gamers. Uh, and as I said, you know, he said this here, but I had already said that he will be at the next year, um, next year's PC gaming conference. So, you know, it was a heartfelt video. It was definitely awesome to see. We really didn't see any gameplay from Star Citizen, but, you know, a nice little thing right there. Then they had the chief gaming scientist of AMD come out. They had to have AMD time because, of course, this is AMD's thing right here. But he came out with a briefcase, and he came out with a few graphics cards, and this guy just looked like a genius scientist walking in with all that. It was awesome. He talked about his role as a communications-type role in AMD, and he said he essentially is kind of the liaison showing, like, you know, talking to dev, seeing what they want, where they should be in years' time, and he tries to adapt that to the engineers and developers in AMD themselves. So then he was asking, you know, what's beyond just tackling and adding in more polygons? And they were talking about, you know, the new things they had released. They actually, today, they had announced nine new graphics cards. Now, I myself am a GTX person, but, uh, well, NVIDIA person, but I gotta say, I mean, AMD, they look like they have some pretty awesome cards going on right now. They said they've talked about the introductions of the Radeon R7 and the R9 300 series graphics cards. Uh, they have, you know, graphics cards set for esports gamers, uh, anywhere from, you know, basic, casual, esports, high-end gamers. Uh, there's also FreeSync that is going to be in their cards as well that they are trying to support that technology with, uh, which is going to be essentially, you know, buttery smooth vision, no screen tearing or anything like that. And they've even said that these high-end graphics cards, or even, you know, the pretty good ones, are going to be as low as like $140. So they're definitely trying to appeal to everyone. So whether you want to pay $140 or maybe, what, like $800 for a card, they got you. Now, they were also asking where virtual reality fits in. Uh, and they were saying, you know, Oculus, for example, is wanting a 90th of a second response time. So they have to make sure everything is fine-tuned software-wise, hardware-wise, and you have to have a really beefy p computer for this as well. But they said, you know, they're trying to work on everything, and with new OSs, DirectX 12 and all that coming out, it's really helping. And with that, DirectX 12, 
They, he spoke about that as well. He said this is a wonderful transition for the industry. Uh, it's essentially doing, uh, it's allowing AMD to do what they've always wanted to do, which they are saying is going to maximize the amount of value out of the hardware. Uh, and it's also going to open up every CPU core and open up more possibilities to the GPU itself. Uh, then, you know, Sean started asking, is that why whenever I play a game, I notice that CPUs, one, well, cores one and two are just the ones running and my other cores really aren't doing anything. And he did a great job of explaining this to people who aren't technical. But he was saying, you know, essentially what's happened with so many games is that CPUs, like the way they work normally is one core is going to handle the stuff and the second core is just going to handle all the offset stuff. Now with this, DirectX 12 is going to solve that and there's not going to be any more CPU cores fighting. It's going to try and handle everything proper. With this, he ended up handing over the suitcase to Sean and said he couldn't open it yet, but he did show off the Nitro Sapphire brand card, which is a R9 card. It's more oriented for virtual reality, it has a gigabyte of memory on it, and it is about $300. And then he didn't say the price for this one, but he also showed the Asus R9 390X card, which has 8 gigabytes of memory on it, so that's some pretty crazy stuff. Now, before he went off, Sean did screw up, and he said that he has a 6-core monitor. <laughs> he said that, and he caught himself, and people were laughing, and he said, you know, I'm sure Twitch is giving me a 6.5 out of 10 right now. So, I mean, he was very entertaining. Now, this whole time, every time somebody was coming up, there was this guy in the back who was just yelling, Woo! Just, like, doing that. And Sean was saying that he loved that guy. He's just like, you know what? Just keep cheering. I love you. I love what you're doing. But then... The next game that came up where this guy, you know, he yelled and everything was Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Uh, and it was funny because Sean even told the developers, he said, you know, you can never release a good game and have a follow-up. That's dangerous. Of course, he meant it in a joking term, but he was talking about the previous entry, which was Deus Ex Human Resolu Revolution. Excuse me. Now, this takes two place two years after Human Revolution, and... They also got to show, in addition to a little bit of gameplay, right before they showed a demonstration of the Dawn engine, which is what they are using. Uh, essentially, it's going to allow a lot more clutter, more objects on screen, uh, but just not even that, just an insane amount of color correction, dynamic lighting on the fly. It looks excellent. It looks excellent so far. I can honestly say that. Uh, they did show some gameplay. It looks very dark, but great lighting and detail even with a low quality stream i thought it looked great uh and they also spoke heavily about coding for the gameplay balance itself uh you know some people can play it stealthy some people can play it guns blazing but they also keep in mind they said when developing the game that they don't know what players are going to do and it's interesting to always see that so right after this they said there was something else that was coming out and right as that was happening somebody in the back yelled out half-life 3 and then it was funny because uh, Sean, he just yelled. He's just like, no, easy. Unlike the Wu guy here, the Half-Life 3 guy just has to hold it. So I guess I'll spoil this for you all now. There was no Half-Life 3. That was the only reference to Half-Life 3 during this conference. So that was disappointing, but I wasn't really getting my hopes up for that. But what happened was then they had a CGI trailer for, for the new Total War game, which is Total War Warhammer. I don't know why they did CGI, I mean, I guess they wanted to make it more realistic, but I prefer gameplay trailers. It was well done, I just didn't want it to be CGI. They even asked, why don't they just call the game Total Warhammer, and even the developers, they were joking around, they are saying, you know, you could call it that if you want to, we have the permission to, but this is essentially a Total War version of the tabletop game of Warhammer, which in case you don't know, it's quite an interesting game, but this looks like the game that Warhammer people have been wanting. Like if they want a video game, this is what they want. I think they are pulling off something great right here, even though I'm not a Total War fan. I just have never really played the series. Now then, Phil Spencer, the head of Xbox came out, and it was funny because, you know, people were laughing quite a bit when he came out, but they openly welcomed him, so they asked, you know, why is Microsoft here? And he was praising the PC. He said that he thinks uh, the P it's great that there's a PC gaming conference, and people are cheering for it, and he said, you know, he's very supportive of it, and he even acknowledged, he said, there's been times in the past where Microsoft has gone astray, and they have screwed up. They've screwed over PC users, but, you know, they're trying to get everything back. Uh, they want to talk directly to the fans and to the press this was the perfect time to do it and they said that one big thing was you know windows 10 from a consumer standpoint 
free OS. From a developer standpoint, it's going to be so much easier because DirectX 12 is going to become integrated. The same API set is going to be available there for Xbox Live if somebody wants to work with Xbox Live on Windows 10. Uh, and everyone, if, if more of the market share has Windows 10, that's going to be easier for the developers to adapt to. They don't have to worry about, you know, this game working on Windows 8, Windows 8.1, Windows 7, Windows XP, you know, all the other operating systems as much. They can focus more on Windows 10. That is going to be the bigger market share. But he was saying, you know, this is going to open up a lot of opportunities for cross-platform play with the Xbox One and Windows 10 PC users, and that there are going to be differences, and that he's not there to dictate and say, you need to do this, you need to do that, but he wants the option to be available there to developers and with that there were some big announcements that started coming in first off was killer instinct the xbox one exclusive is now coming to pc but he said and i quote you can play on pc console back and forth so he didn't really say cross-platform i'm assuming he meant cross-platform but he didn't say that directly now, then they ended up bringing out free-to-play games, and they showed Fable Legends. Essentially, the new trailer was just them showing off what Windows could do. They said, of course, you can play on Xbox One and Windows 10. You could do cross-platform, and they just wanted to build an incredibly cool story-based world, and everything, you know, can come together as one on both console and PC. But they've said that DirectX 12 will allow them to essentially put more beautiful picture pixels, excuse me, in a smaller space. This is a free-to-play game, and they actually talked for a few minutes, the developers did, about the stigma behind the free-to-play model. They said that essentially, everyone wants to play it, they can make their own decisions, and this is a completely different Fable game. It's not like Fable 1 or 2 or 3 or any of those other games, so the only way fa fans could really figure out if they like it is to play it. So that way, they said, you know, they don't, they're not stuck with a $60 price tag, they're not going to do an ex a uh, subscription model, but they are going to be adding new content to it. They plan for years of content with new characters, new quests, there's going to be controller and keyboard and mouse support, of course, but you know, native controller supports on the PC version as well, so it works out pretty well. Uh, but they were just saying, you know, they just wanted to give this game out, and then if you want to, you could buy into the other stuff. Next game was Gigantic. Now, as I said, both of these games were shown at Microsoft's conference, but, you know, this is another free-to-play game. Uh, they said it's a 5 versus 5 PvP game, works cross-platform between Windows 10 and, Win and Xbox One. Essentially, each team has five heroes, and they have one Guardian, and whichever Guardian ends up dying is going to be the losing team. So it's a mix of a shooter and a MOBA. They said there's varied characters for, you know, Twitch shooting, uh, magic skills, anything like that and there's going to be a beta coming out August 2015. Now, there is a closed beta for it. This is going to be closed, but they said open. look for an open beta later this year. <sighs> Next up, this was big. This is going to either make people happy, make people laugh, or make people angry. Gears of War Ultimate Edition was announced on PC. They said it's coming to PC, it's going to be open for 4K resolution and unlimited refresh rate. Uh, what I found funny was the trailer that they showed for this still said Xbox exclusive, but they have claimed that everything was rebuilt from the ground up for this. There's going to be 19 multiplayer maps, new game modes, and essentially game modes also brought over from Gears of War 3 into Ultimate Edition, and because it's Windows 10, game DVR and other features that the Xbox take, uh, takes advantage of are going to work here. Now, they didn't say anything about cross-platform with the Xbox One version of it, but they did say they hinted at this heavily. They said they have no plans to announce any other Gears of War games yet, but they are happy to announce more at a later time. So we might see even more Gears of War games. We might see Gears 2 and Gears 3 for the first time on PC. Let's see what's going on. I'd love to see those on PC, actually. But man, that's just crazy that happened. I don't know what's going on with Microsoft now. Well, at least Xbox specifically. I don't know. It's just, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. But anyways, next up, Sean said this is pretty much him selling out. He put on a trucker hat, and he said from the creators that made Euro Truck Simulator comes American Truck Simulator. It looks good. It was made heavily using Google Maps, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but then next up, they also started talking about virtual reality quite a bit. They said this was the big elephant in the room. It is kind of awkward. And then they brought in the developer, one of the developers behind Eve Valkyrie. And this is a space combat game that puts you right into the cockpit of a spaceship. You survive in space. 
and they even showed some video of Sean playing it the previous night, and he said that it had been several years since he even used an Oculus, and the last time he used an Oculus Rift, he threw up. I feel for him because the first, I've only used an Oculus Rift one time. I used it for about an hour, and I had a headache the entire next day. It's it's some intense stuff, I'll tell you that. But I would say this looks great. It looks amazing. It's one of the first, probably the first Oculus Rift game that has graphically impressed me. And it just shows him, you know, dogfighting through space and all that. It looks very intense. VR is something it's so hard to explain. You have to try it for yourself, honestly. But he was sweating afterwards. He tried this demo, and he was sweating afterwards. They said that this game has been built specifically from the ground up for virtual reality. And honestly, this would make me buy an Oculus. I'm just saying, this would make me buy an Oculus Rift. This game looks awesome. And I, I do want to invest in one once the retail Oculus Rift comes out, because I didn't want a dev kit. But they have also said that EVE Online and EVE Valkyrie are going to be separate, But and they have also said that EVE Valkyrie is going to be an insane, intense experience, which, trust me, it definitely does. Now, next up, they showed this a little bit at the Microsoft conference, but ION was showed right here. Now, we didn't see anything new. It was the exact same thing we'd really seen before, just trailers. And this is early access. They said it's a... The guy behind it, Dean Hall, he worked with Daisy. He has a huge range of experience with early access. And essentially, it was just, you know, another kind of CGI thematic sequence type uh, trailer. But then he was saying that the camera is supposed to be like Diablo. But it's not supposed to be anything like Star Citizen or Elite or Eve. Uh, you're exploring space stations. And the thing is, they didn't really give many details on it. He even said they really don't want to give details because they just want to have a super polished product upon release. So there's not too much I can talk about with this. But he said it's definitely been a big challenge. And they asked, well, Sean specifically asked what the best bug has been so far on Ion. And they said they found a bug when they were internally testing it that if you clicked on another player, all their organs fell out. <laughs> so they said that there's going to be realistic organ simulation in here. And with that, it definitely sounds like that this is going to be an MMO of some kind, which I was not expecting. Next up, they had the first live demo on stage, which was for a game called Strafe. This essentially, there were two guys on up on stage who were showing it, and they said this is a game that is paying homage, homage, I can't even talk tonight, man. It is a tribute, there we can say that, homage, tribute, to games that they loved in their childhood. To me, it looks like a combination of Doom, Quake, Minecraft, and some Left 4 Dead. And it looks really fun. It's bloody. It's pixelated. It looks fun. And this is supposed to change dynamically. There's a essentially scripting that goes on in the background that tells the game how it should act and how it should build things. But even for a pre-alpha, it looks very great, and it's definitely going to be dynamic. It's nothing that's going to be static. They asked at the very end, you know, what is expected of this gameplay? And the developer said, the game is essentially jump in, paint shit red, you die, and repeat. Looks fun. Next up, Pillars of Autumn Etern well, Pillars of Eternity, the White March Part 1 expansion. This is a CGI trailer right here. Apparently, if you play Pillars of Eternity, you could be excited for this. I haven't played it personally, but apparently there's going to be a higher level cap. There's going to be new abilities, new companions, and they talked quite a bit about how Kickstarter changed the market for this. They didn't really show much about it, though, honestly. Next up... CGI trailer again, really didn't show any gameplay footage of this, but Planet Coaster. It's by the people who did Elite Dangerous, and I felt so bad for this guy. This guy who came up on stage, he starts talking, he had serious stage fright. Like, he got, like, two sentences in, and then he, like, stumbled over a word and just had to, like, stand there and just breathe into his hand for, like, 20 seconds. And, you know, people were kind of trying to cheer for him and all that, and I think that almost made it worse. But then he regained his composure and he was able to pr reveal the game. It's coming out in 2016. It looks pretty much like if Pixar did a game, like just only a game, this would be it. But it's a theme park style game that's all build it yourself, has some humor to it, and they've said it's an extremely dangerous, well, extremely different tone from Elite Dangerous. I can definitely say that. Next up, the Guild Wars 2 Heart of Thorns expansion. Now, I am not a Guild Wars player. I really don't play MMOs, as many of you might know. Uh, but they were talking about, the main thing was the Guild Hall, which is a world-exclusive premiere right here. It's a new social feature, and you can apparently claim your own Guild Hall. You can unlock new features with guild buildings that you build in there. 
It looks awesome. I'll be honest, it looks awesome. For me, I've never played Guild Wars 1 or 2, and it looks really cool. It's essentially also going to have an arena as well, which is going to be a combat sandbox. And they even say, you know, after the trailer showed here, uh, it's a social feature, but that looked like a lot of shit. That's what they said. <laughs> so, essentially, you get your entire map that your guild owns themselves. Guilds are able to band together and fight into a jungle. They're able to claim their own hall, and from there you can form guild teams that are going to go out and they can play competitive PvP matches. There's going to be guild missions that you can access through the portal. There's going to be a workshop where you're actually able to build items for everyone in your guild and they can take them into the world, and it is on pre-sale right now. If you buy the pre if you pre-purchase it now, you'll get beta access to everything as it comes out. Next up, Hitman. Now, we already saw this a little bit. Uh, we saw some footage of it, but we got to see even more of it here. And at first, I thought it might be a CGI trailer, but no, I think this is the actual game itself. Uh, they said that it almost looks like Hitman is finally stepping into the digital age. They were showing off the game, and <sighs> this game looks stunning. I'm not, a mo I'm not a Hitman fan, honestly, but it looks stunning. They say it takes place in Paris, it's going to be completely sandbox, there's going to be live events taking place, it's going to be completely dynamic gameplay, the locations in the new Hitman are going to be 6 or 7 times bigger than any of the biggest locations they had in their older games, and there's going to be no checkpoints, which is just going to bring the ultimate assassination experience, is what they said. December 8th is when that's coming out. Now, with all the games, they had to break it up a little bit. They brought in the CEO of AMD, who was Lisa Su, who I thought would be, you know, really awkward and all that, but this lady was awesome. I loved her. I'm just saying that. But she was talking about Hitman, and she said Hitman is all about that 4K experience, and that's the experience that we want our technology to enable, and she mentioned, you know, that they just launched nine cards today alone. So she talked about the cards a little bit. She talked about the flagship card, which is the Radeon R9 Fury X, which is apparently the first high bandwidth technology card. It's designed for 4K and DirectX 12, and this is also going to be the flagship card for virtual reality. They also announced, well, they showed the Radeon R9 Nano, which is only 6 inches long, another high bandwidth card in the smallest form factor, which also supports 4K. <laughs> <laughs> this little thing also supports 4K, which is absolutely insane because she said, you know, there are people who want to build bulky computers, big gaming computers, I myself like that, or people that want to, you know, set up a little media center or something in there, uh, like just that goes under their TV. They brought the briefcase out. She actually got kind of mad at Sean because he slammed the briefcase down and... And then there was a guy who came around from the back who was in shades, he had a tuxedo on, looked like a spy. He brought out this square looking gaming system, which is a 16 teraflop gaming system. It apparently has two Fiji GPUs in there, just this insanely small box. They said it has a elegant and great cooling system and that it is actively being used to run VR demos upstairs at E3 right now. The case opened up, you know, the suitcase that we talked about earlier that ended up opening it up. They ended up opening it up and uh, Lisa ended up taking out what was inside and she said, this is something you could have broken. And it was the first dual Fiji GPU card. Now they did not have the heatsink on there so we could actually show it, but she definitely said, you know, she was showing it off, people were cheering and she said, AMD loves gaming, they are all for gaming, all that stuff. They love us is what they're trying to say. So she took the card, this is all new, new technology they can't be giving out, but you know what, at least Sean got to keep the really nice briefcase, that was pretty cool. So then we get back to the games. First off, we got to see an expansion for, I had to write down how to say this, but Tenoa. Uh, the Arma 3 Tenoa expansion from Bohemia Interactive, and it looks amazing. I've never played Arma 3, I really didn't play Arma 2 actually, I think I installed DayZ and I never tried it, but... It looks amazing. The graphics are absolutely insane. I did only notice one texture pop out at one point, but it's coming out 2016 and it's been described as a green hell. Now it looks like it's, you know, taking place in like a tropical island area somewhere. And they said that these islands are going to be a central component to the game. They are new to the Arma series, and this is also a brand new canvas for modders to play with and use, because they know that they essentially build the game as a platform, and you can play it, but Arma is also free to mod. I mean, without Arma 2, we wouldn't have DayZ. Look at that. 
But they did say, the developers said this, which I found was quite funny. They said they are looking forward to dinosaur mods. So, hey, if there's some dinosaur mods for Armor 3, I'm going to be all over that. Now, the next game, we saw this a little bit at a previous conference, was Beyond Eyes. And you all know, I thought this game was absolutely beautiful. And they actually got to talk about it here. So, it's an exploration game. If you don't get to explore... Well, essentially, if you don't explore anything, you're not going to see it. Because it's about a girl who is blind, who is exploring the world for the first time. And it's just absolutely beautiful. The game just makes me smile. And it draws heavily upon audio because it's essentially using your other senses to detect what's going on. So they even said, you know, there might be some running water that you hear and it's just, you know, it feels beautiful and all that stuff. But then you find out it's a sewage plant. (laughs) Uh, Apparently, the person who was making this game said that she started it when it was in college and when she was in college and she's been working on it since then. And the scope creep of it was the biggest challenge, you know, because the scope just kept changing on. And I love that they talked about that so openly. But it's a beautiful, amazing art style. I can't wait to play this game. It looks great. Next game coming up, apparently this has been really big on Twitch, and it is Dirty Bomb. It is the first shooter that actually belongs to the company Splash Damage. Splash Damage has actually worked on several other games, uh, you know, with publishing, anything like that. But this is the first game they have that is actually theirs. Now, again, this was kind of a cinematic CGI trailer, but it was quite funny. It actually reminds me a lot of Team Fortress 2 combined with Deadpool, which is just raw and great at the same time. It looks super entertaining. It looks like a great game. It's free to play on Steam right now. And apparently, if you watch the full trailer on the official website for Dirty Bomb, you'll get a free Merc in-game. So go ahead, hop on that. Next up, we saw Tacoma. That was also revealed at a previous conference from another company. But this is a first-person exploration game like Gone Home. It's in the future. They use a high-tech space station setting. Zero gravity allows you to launch yourself through the environment. And it's just a full playground for complete digital exploration is what they were saying. It was the same footage that they showed at the Microsoft conference. So if you saw that footage, you're going to see the same stuff here. But I will say, what I really liked is that all these developers that showed games, you know, either at the Sony conference or at the uh, Microsoft conference, they actually got to talk about their games. The indie people got to talk about them. And I thought that was just so invaluable. Now, next up, they had Soma. This is a new game from the team that did Amnesia. They said they wanted to take horror in a slightly different direction and deepen what happened in Amnesia and use it to question your identity and what it's like to be human. That, That sounds so terrible. Man, y'all know I love my horror games. (laughs) But it's set under the sea. They showed a little bit of gameplay, just like a minute of gameplay. Extremely dark, extremely foreboding. And I think I would like this more than Amnesia. I didn't find Amnesia entertaining, honestly. But they said, like, not they said, but to me it almost looked kind of like a Big Daddy Slender type thing. Definitely looked entertaining. I need to see more about it. But the thing is with this game, just like Amnesia, you have to shroud it around mystery. That's the key to it. It's coming out September 22nd on PC and PlayStation 4 for any PlayStation 4 players who are listening to this. Next up, they presented DayZ. And they said that this has been in early access for over a year and a half at this point. Now, they try and put out a build every single month. They've had some very successful continued success with the early access program. And that single player, here's the thing. Single player is going to be an option soon coming into the beta. This game is finally coming out of alpha. It's going into beta. They are adding a single player option in case you want to play by yourself. So, for example, like me, I would love to play DayZ alone. Uh, For people who want the ultimate, you know... I'm the only survivor in a zombie horror apocalypse experience. This is going to be perfect for them. It's a sandbox for modders to test out their mods offline before releasing them online. Uh, and they're also going to be releasing the Daisy server hosting tool, which you can use on anything from, you know, your own computer at a LAN party to a data center. And they said, you know, one reason why this is taking so long is because they're developing Daisy and the engine at the same time, which I just found shocking. I mean, that's... So much work, but yes, Daisy is going to be going into beta soon, and it looks like you all are going to be getting a lot of kick-ass features. I think I'm probably going to pick it up, too, if that happens. Next up, they had a game called Take on Mars, and they noted that this was actual gameplay, and it's a space sim exploration, and it looks excellent. I think it looks great. There's going to be, it's essentially multiplayer survival, and it's now available for early access. Beta is going to be coming later. That's essentially what they released with that. 
Project Blue Streak. This is a game coming from Cliff, Cliff Blazinski, otherwise known as Cliffy B. Some people might know him when he worked, you know, for Epic Games, where he worked on the Unreal games and the Gears of War franchise before he ended up leaving. And he said he really missed being a part of the game industry. He essentially said, you know, sitting and reading a book by a poolside is great, but it gets boring real quickly. And he got bored after about six months. He wanted to get back into gaming, but he said he wanted to get back into first person. He worked heavily on Gears of War, which is a great game. But third person game, as you all know, and he even congratulated the people who were working on it. He said, you know, great job to the remake to Ultimate Edition on there. And one thing that surprised me, he actually said he's turning 40. He he dropped that on himself too. But he said he's turning 40 this year, and he's wanting to make a game that everyone can get into. So the people who have super fast reaction times can play it with the people like him who are kind of slow with their games, not they're getting older and everything. But he said that he wants to make a game that is first person and it is easy to learn, but it takes a lifetime to master, and that it's just a shooter that everyone could like. He also note, noted that he prefers keyboard and mouse, that he thinks that is superior compared to a controller, so nice for that. And then at the, it was funny because at the end, um, even day nine, you know, he was saying, well, by day nine, I mean Sean. Uh, he was saying that he wishes everyone developed for PC, you know, just like Cliff Blazinski here. And he said he was looking specifically at Bloodborne. So, you know, they were having fun there. It was awesome. But yeah, you know, it was definitely interesting to see this, but we really didn't see much of it. And that was a few games this conference, you know, they just really talked about them. But what I loved about Sean himself was that he actually openly asked those questions. He's like, why aren't we seeing more of this? Why is it that you're not showing us this? When are we going to see more? And he he just, he did a great job with that. He really did. Next up, another live demo, which was Enter the Gungeon. Yes, I, I said Gungeon, not Dungeon right there. It's a pixelated, isometric, dungeon crawler, bullet hell shooter, Binding of Isaac type game that actually reminds me a lot of an ultra-violent game called Loaded that was back on the PS1. Very fun game, by the way. But, you know, the people who developed this said they are a big fan of Dark Souls, so they wanted, you know, that dark, eerie, bloody type game. Uh, they wanted dodge rolling through bullets as well, too. They wanted to make an extremely hard game. And it was actually funny because Sean was co-oping this with one of the developers, and they even said that they had to enable God Mode for Sean's controller. He's like, no, look, they enabled God mode. Watch this. And he just killed himself right there. And people just busted out laughing. <laughs> but then after that, they had a Heroes of the Storm expansion, which I've never played Heroes of the Storm, but this actually looks pretty cool. The expansion is called e e Eternal Conflict. It's from Blizzard Entertainment, obviously. And this game, well, Heroes of the Storm, not the expansion, has now officially been released for anyone that doesn't know. Now, at first I was like, wait, this looks a lot like Diablo. And that's pretty much what it is. Eternal Conflict is going to be a Diablo 3 expansion for Heroes of the Storm, where essentially you're going to have all the bosses, all the heroes, all the characters from Diablo 3 come in here. It looks great. It's coming out June 30th. It's essentially a MOBA version of Diablo 3, and they even said that the the Treasure Goblin is a feature in here, which you can like get a bonus if you you know try and kill the Treasure Goblin before the match. Anybody who played Diablo 3 will know what I'm talking about with that damn Treasure Goblin. <laughs> but you know, it, it looks great so far. They even said that with Heroes of the storm they were internally calling it blizzcon or blizzard the game because this was essentially based with nothing but feedback from their fans when it was you know in beta and alpha for so long uh and also king leoric the skeleton king is going to be a hero which king leoric is just an awesome guy so we'll see how it goes or skeleton i don't know Starcraft 2, Legacy of the Void, the Whispers of Doom expansion. Now, this was a CGI trailer, and this is essentially going to entail three prologue missions. Now, I actually had to look this up, because I don't play Starcraft, but Scar Starcraft 2, Legacy of the Void is essentially a standalone game uh, expansion, if you will, of Starcraft 2, and Whispers of Doom is going to be the expansion for Legacy of the Void. Uh, they said that this essentially, story-wise, it connects the end of the Heartless Swarm to the beginning of Legacy of the Void. I believe the beta is going to be starting July 2015, so in one month, and early access requires a pre-order, but the three missions will be available for free to everyone worldwide. Apparently, that's what they're saying, so I'm assuming if you buy the game, no matter what, you're going to get those free missions anyways, which is pretty cool. No Man's Sky. This is the last game they showed right here. 
and they actually really didn't show too much. It was all pre-recorded footage. Uh, you know, they actually got to have a demo of it in a previous conference earlier, uh, but essentially they showed all the awards. It was a whole new trailer, but it was pre-recorded gameplay and all that, so it wasn't just CGI, but they showed all the awards and all the anticipation, all the praise of people, and it was even funny because, you know, the developer came out and he's just like, yeah, I think LA is getting to them, and Sean was just busting out laughing at that. It looks amazing. It's essentially a beautiful neon paradise. That's the best way I can describe it. And it's coming out at the same time for PS4 and PC. No release date yet, though, because they said they were going to release a release date at E3, but they just can't do it for, you know, a few reasons. Now, it was funny because even with that release date, as I said, and with the release and him showing up here for the PC conference, Sean even asked, well, wait a minute, this was a PlayStation exclusive, so why are you here? And he said, well... Uh, it's coming out on PC too, but at the same time. Now the crazy thing is this game is absolutely massive and I highly recommend checking out the footage from the PlayStation event if you have not seen it, but there are only 10 people working on this game. 10 people, that's it. They said the way they have it running is that there are pretty much bots that are running through the game itself and they are kind of reporting back and giving them reports saying yes, this is working well, no, this is broken, this needs to be fixed on this planet. And they said that there was no scope for this project. They lost the scope. They completely lost it. And the developer even said that people have told him that this game sounds like the game design of a child. And he doesn't know if he should take it the right way or the wrong way. You know, if it's good or bad. I personally find that as a compliment because it almost seems like, you know, he took a game that he wanted to play as a child and made it. And with that... <sighs> You know what, this is this has been my longest recap so far, over 40 minutes, but this was a two and a half hour show, you all, two and a half hours, and I tried to get through it as fast as I could, <laughs> but at the end of the two and a half hours, they said that they had successfully completed the first ever PC gaming show, and man, that was a show. As I said, if you've come to the very end of this video, thank you very much for listening. Let me know what your thoughts are, and my criticisms of it were, I think it was the best show, but I think that for streaming people, uh, for audience-wise and all that, there needs to be more transparency, it needs to be promoted better, and I think the show needs to be capped at like an hour and a half, because two hours, it was getting to be a bit tiring, and two and a half hours, that was really stretching it. Anyways, this is Mr. Mario signing off, thank you for watching, everyone.